On the 13th of January 2016, a dry lightning storm passed over North and West Tasmania. Hundreds of lightning strikes ignited multiple fires in exceptionally dry and inaccessible terrain. This marked the start of a firefighting campaign that lasted in an excess of two months and involved the use of unprecedented levels of interstate support and aviation resources. A total of 229 fires were recorded from the 13th of January to the 15th of March, burning a total area of 124,000 hectares with a combined perimeter of 1,260 kilometres in largely remote, rugged and inaccessible areas. Then, on Christmas Eve in 2018, a deliberately started fire on Bruny Island burned 122 hectares and required the evacuation of holidaymakers and residents. This incident, significant in itself, heralded the start of the 2018-2019 fire season in Tasmania. In terms of hectares burnt, the largest since 1967. Subsequent dry lightning strikes ignited fires at Gel River on December 27th, Great Pine Tier on the 15th of January, and in the Huon Valley also on the 15th of January. These are to name but three of the many serious and significant fires that burned over 210,000 hectares of Tasmania during the summer. The vast majority of these fires were caused by lightning. Our planet is over four and a half billion years old. And throughout the Earth's entire history, lightning has been its constant companion. Today, we see around 100 lightning strikes around our planet every second. And that adds up to around 8 million strikes per day and 3 billion strikes every year. And with that much lightning being triggered around the world, it might come as no surprise that lightning has been a driving force for change and evolution in the Earth's vegetation since it evolved into plants that were large enough to burn. The oldest known evidence for vegetation burning on our planet is from a small leafless plant that lived on our planet around 410 million years ago. Since then, our planet has seen enormous amounts of change. Between 395 and 360 million years ago, the Earth's vegetation evolved from small primitive plants to vegetation that included trees. This not only changed the face of our Earth and its atmosphere forever, but it also gave rise to wildfires for the very first time. Since then, the Earth has seen numerous ice ages and many types of vegetation have evolved to suit their surroundings. It is over this vast period of time that the Earth has evolved into the planet that we know today. But it would not have done this without some serious disruption. Because disruption is one of the ways that the living organisms on our planet are forced into evolving and adapting to their surroundings. And fire is one of the most significant disruptions there is. Now there has always been many different natural causes for fire. Rock falls, volcanic eruptions and meteorites are just a few. But by far and away, the most common natural cause of fire is lightning. Now lightning can take many forms and only a very small percentage of lightning strikes will actually start a fire. But to find out which strikes are likely to start a fire and which strikes are not, we first need to learn a little bit more about what lightning is and how it actually works. As storms build, they can create large areas of electrical charges in and around them. As these charges build, they can create channels of ionised air, known as leaders, that can reach out between the oppositely charged areas. If these leaders are able to come in contact with an area of an opposite charge, 
that a mass cascade of electrons is then triggered between the two areas. And this is what we know as a lightning strike. And when these discharges happen within a storm, they're known as intracloud lightning or cloud-to-cloud -cloud lightning. And as the name suggests, they never make contact with the ground. However, some lightning does make contact with the ground. And this is known as cloud-to-ground lightning. And it is cloud-to-ground lightning that can be the cause of wildfires. But just because lightning has struck the ground, this doesn't necessarily mean that it will start a fire. In fact, depending on what the conditions are like when the lightning strikes, there can be less than a 1% chance that any given lightning strike will start a fire. This very low probability of ignition is due to the fact that for a fire to be ignited in the landscape, there are a whole range of different variables, such as the fuel type, distribution and moisture content that need to be just right before a fire can be ignited. These factors are also affected by the fact that where there is lightning, there is also often rain to follow it. And this rain will often wet the landscape to the point where it will no longer support a fire. But not all lightning is accompanied by rain. Dry lightning occurs when a storm passes over an area without dropping any or only minimal amounts of rain. And intuitively, it has been found that dry lightning is far more likely to start a fire as it passes over a landscape. This can occur in a number of different ways. For example, if there is a dry air mass under a high base storm, then as the rain falls from the cloud, it can be re-evaporated back up into the storm before it ever reaches the ground. This is commonly known as Virga. Another way in which dry lightning can occur is if a storm is moving quickly over the landscape and therefore the ground underneath the storm only receives a very small amount of rain. Regardless of how it happens, if a storm passes over an area and deposits little or no rainfall, and the conditions on the ground are primed to support combustion, then all it takes is a spark. But with so many variables affecting the flammability of a landscape, even at the most efficient of times, only a very small percentage of lightning strikes will actually start a fire. But thunderstorms can create thousands of lightning strikes, spreading over hundreds of kilometers. And with so many strikes covering such large areas, the probability of a fire being ignited becomes far more likely. The effect of widespread dry lightning strikes was seen in Tasmania in 2016 and again in 2019, when several significant dry lightning storms passed over the width of the state. On both occasions, the storm sparked hundreds of fires in the landscape and were going to burn for many months and burn out hundreds of thousands of hectares of bushland. And these fire seasons would go down in history as some of the largest fire seasons the state has ever seen. But as significant as these fires were, they form only part of a much larger change that has been unfolding in the state in relation to the frequency and size of lightning ignited fires. With a recent substantial increase in the frequency of these fires and the area burnt. To gain a better understanding of what's been happening, pyrogeographer Jenny Steiger has been undertaking some research into the matter. Since around the year 2000, we've seen a significant increase in both the number of fires that have been caused by lightning ignitions, but um, more importantly, an increase in the area burnt, a substantial increase in the area burnt as a result of lightning ignited fires. So this raises a really important question. Are we actually seeing more dry lightning or is it something else such as just more lightning overall 
or an increase in the efficiency of the lightning that we are getting. There's a few things that could be causing this increase in the lightning efficiency, if that is indeed what's occurring. One of them is higher fuel load, and another factor is just drier conditions overall, which results in a higher soil dryness index. So the evidence is pointing to more regular and larger lightning ignited fires. But to find out why, we would need to go back and have a look at the historical records to determine what is the cause for this change. So unfortunately in Tasmania, we don't have consistent records of lightning that go back in time to tell us whether there's actually a greater occurrence of lightning, a greater occurrence of lightning that's not associated with rainfall, which um, you know we've been talking about as dry lightning, or whether there's an increase in the lightning ignition efficiency. What we do know using the fire history records is that there is an increase in both the number of fires that have been caused by lightning ignitions, as well as the area burnt um, as a result of lightning ignited fires. So we can't tell what the actual cause of this increase in number and area of lightning ignited fires is. What we do know from research that's been conducted around the world is that there has been an association between increased dry lightning activity and climate change and that's been documented from other places around the world and that's probably most likely what we're seeing in Tasmania although we can't say that definitively at this stage. But it is a common belief in Australia that the Australian bush is supposed to burn and that it in fact relies on fire to help regenerate itself. And while this might be true for some areas, it's not quite so simple for others. The landscape of the Tasmanian Wilderness World Heritage Area is really unique in it in that it contains these mosaics of vegetation where you have these extremely flammable landscapes such as eucalypt forests, button grass moorland that occur right up against the boundary of these vegetation communities that have existed since Gondwana. So these are as old as the dinosaurs and because they've persisted in these cool and moist microclimates in Western Tasmania, they haven't adapted like the majority of the rest of the vegetation of mainland Australia and indeed Eastern Tasmania into these fire loving communities of eucalypt forests, heathland, shrubland. And so they are extremely sensitive to fire. And these communities can potentially be wiped out in a single fire. In theory, um, studies have shown that they take between 500 and 1,000 years to regenerate into the forests that they once were. However, in a drying climate, it's unlikely that this will actually, in effect, be able to happen. And the vulnerable nature of these vegetation types is not the only layer of complexity when it comes to managing these wildfires. Because often, these fires are ignited in very remote and isolated locations which requires specialised teams of firefighters to be dropped off by helicopter and supported by water bombing aircraft to effectively fight these fires. Now this work can be very arduous, but it is vital that these firefighters and aircraft are deployed as soon as possible to catch a fire while it is still small. Because once a fire grows past a certain size, fire agencies need to switch their focus from extinguishing the fire to managing different priorities and exposures. And to add even more complexity, lightning can strike anywhere. And fires can burn over vast distances, meaning while they may start in remote locations, they can burn until they reach civilization, which by the time a fire reaches a populated area, it can be such a size where it can endanger an entire town. And Australia is no stranger to lightning ignited fires impacting on its populated areas. And while lightning fires are common in the Australian landscape, there are two examples that stand head and shoulders 
above the rest. And these examples have gone down in history as some of the most significant fire seasons that Australia has ever seen. The first of which occurred in 2003, when several lightning ignited fires converged on Australia's capital city, Canberra. During these fires, four people lost their lives, 488 buildings were destroyed, and over 160,000 hectares of area was burnt. And these fires grew to such a size and ferocity that they generated one of the only documented cases of a genuine fire tornado. This tornado was eventually rated as an F2 on the enhanced Vegeta scale and was responsible for breaking trees in half and throwing cars from the street. And it was the lessons learned from this fire and other fires like it that helped shape the Australian Fire Agency's understanding of lightning ignited fires and the dangers that they can represent. The second example is from the 2019 and 2020 Black Summer fires. These fires burnt over a significant period of time, during which time 26 people lost their lives, 2,448 homes were destroyed, and over 5.5 million hectares of area was burnt. And an investigation into the fires after the event found that lightning was the suspected immediate cause of ignition for the vast majority of the largest and most damaging fires across New South Wales in the 2019 and 2020 fire season. In this video, we've seen that lightning has existed on Earth since the very earliest days of our planet. And we've also seen that lightning is most likely responsible for the very first appearance of wildfires on Earth. From this, it is clear that fire and lightning have a long and complicated history spanning back millions of years. And this relationship is not set in stone. It is constantly evolving. And although it's not currently clear whether it's a greater amount of dry lightning, longer, drier fire seasons, or a combination of these factors, it is clear that in some places, the conditions that we once knew are not only predicted to change, but they already have. And if these changes continue on their current path, then fire and lightning will not only continue as a driving force for disruption and change in the Australian landscape, but they may become far more prevalent into the future. And if this occurs, then it is entirely possible that lightning ignited fires could become a more common sight on our horizons.